Listen, the Lord is highly interested and involved in, if we will allow him to be, in our relationships. Most of the junk we carry around is because of dysfunctional relationships. And most of the junk we get healed from is because we're connected to good relationships. I just want you to open up your heart again, those of you that have kind of maybe grown closed in, in relationships because you've been wounded or hurt. I just want you to open your heart right now. Just allow the tenderness of the Lord to minister to those places. Amen. Amen. You good? I want to talk about faithful friends today. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite narratives in Scripture that most of us are familiar with is actually in three of the Synoptic Gospels, but I, I want to read from Mark chapter 2. And it says this, when Jesus again <clears throat> entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Ah, yeah. There's God alone in the room. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. Don't you love that? He knows. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Why are you being so critical? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven? Or get up, take up your mat, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Someone say, Jesus never said he was God. He just did. He said to the paralytic, I'll tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. He got the double portion. He didn't just get healed. He got forgiven. He got up, took up his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. Jesus made a scene. I love it. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. There's four characters. There's four characters in this, in this narrative. The first one is Jesus, okay, because we're going to place ourselves in this narrative. You're not him. <laughs> then there's the crowd, but you're not the crowd. You're not a spectator. You're a participator, in the crowd, there's the religious, there's all the people. Then there's the paralytic. Sometimes that's you. Sometimes that's me. Sometimes I'm the guy that needs the healing. Yeah. Sometimes it's you. Sometimes you need the healing. And then there's the four friends. Sometimes you're the one that needs the healing. And sometimes you're the one that is helping your friend get healed. There's a, there's a scripture in... A, in Proverbs, I believe I have it handy. I, I don't have it handy. But it says this, those that refresh others will themselves be refreshed. And we, we've talked a little bit about this. Is being, a, being a good friend, being good at community means that you are developing an environment of encouragement always. And so when you need that encouragement, it is there. You can draw from it. So those that refresh others will be refreshed. And some people just think, man, I just, you've met them. You might be them. And you show up and you need encouragement all the time, but you never have any to bring. It's a victim mentality. And the Lord has more for you than that. First of all, he does want you to be healed. He does want your needs to be addressed. Absolutely. But he also wants you to be an ambassador of healing. And not just be the needy guy all the time. 
but being a participator in the miracle. Come on, how many of y'all want to participate in the miracle? So sometimes we're the paralytic. Sometimes we're one of the friends that is lowering Jesus. And it says this about these friends, that he, these friendships that he had developed. It says when he saw their faith. Beloved, you need people in your life that are faith-filled. You need faith-filled friends. Some of you, the only time you're around faith-filled friends is when you're in this room on Sunday. And that ain't enough. I'm glad you can come, and I'm glad you can be around them. But if you're running around people that are with people all the time that are full of doubt, and you expect you to be encouraged, and you expect to be getting up and walking straight, you're not going to have that until you develop some people that can get you to Jesus. So I want to talk about this from both perspectives. Sometimes it's the friend you need, and sometimes it's the friend you need to be. See, the encounter we need can often be connected with those that we have community with. And the reality is this, is conditions sometimes can make it really difficult to get to Jesus. Maybe it's the state of mind I'm in. Maybe the emotional state I'm in. Maybe it's the trauma that I'm going through. But do I have someone in my life that when I can't get there, they can get me there? Sometimes we can't find our way. But do you have friends that know the way? Do you have friends that know how to tear the roof off and get you to Jesus? Do you have friends that have the strength to lower you to Jesus? Have you developed these friendships? Or are you trying to do it alone? And where, there are a lot of lone rangers in the kingdom of God. This is not why you just need church. This is why you need community. This is why you need to go out and laugh. And you need to go out and have coffee. And you need to go out and have lunch. That's the reason why you need that. Because eventually you're going to need someone else. Because they can see around corners that you can't see around. The first thing is this. you got to be committed to community. If you're going to have faith-filled friendships, you've got to be committed to community. See, these guys didn't decide one day. The paralytic didn't decide one day, hey, I need friends I heard Jesus is coming to town. I'll recruit a couple of friends and then we'll go over. No, these were guys that were already at his bedside. These were guys that he had lunch with. These were guys that saw him in the market. These were guys that that carried his mat other places. These were friendships that he had built. And now they're going to get him to Jesus. See, our pastor that we served under in Amarillo for a couple of years, Richie Brown used to say this. He used to say, if you don't take time to develop relationships when you don't need them, you won't have them when you do. And I thought, man, there is so much wisdom in that. Because most of us will get in despair, we'll get broken, we'll get down, we'll we'll go, I need a friend. And we went through some very difficult time in our marriage, and our family, 12 years ago, it was so hard, and it was so difficult. We didn't have any friends. And it was because we didn't really develop them. And if we would have had friends, we would have got through it a little quicker. We would have had someone to celebrate with us when we got through it, but we didn't have anyone. It says this, In Acts chapter 2, we love the book of Acts. And when we talk about Acts, we're talking about the power of God and, you know, what God's doing. And you hear a lot of, a lot of people that are lone rangers always refer to the book of Acts, but they ignore this verse. Listen to this. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Yes, come on. So we devote ourselves to teaching and to fellowship. And to sharing meals together, including the Lord's Supper. Not just the Lord's Supper, but they also did the Lord's Supper. We're going to do the Lord's Supper next week. They were committed to community. They were committed to, to teaching, to centering their lives around the Word of God. They were committed to fellowship, koinia, the sharing of life together. They were following Jesus together. They went out and ate. They probably didn't go out and eat. They probably just went to one another's house, but this is what they did. Listen, when you get together at at community group or you go out to lunch afterwards with somebody, did you know that you're you're following scripture? 
There is something spiritual about getting around. Daniel reached out to me on Monday. He's like, hey, I don't know if you got anything going on. He's like, I'm in town. You want to go get tacos? Yes. The answer is always yes to tacos. (laughs) And there's something spiritual about sitting across the table just talking life. I've done that with many of you. And we'll do it with more of you. But I'm hoping you do it together. It's one of the most spiritual things that you can do. And you don't even have to, you don't even have to pray like, oh, Father, in King James language, right? <laughs> you, don't, you don't even have to minister to the waitress. It's awesome if you do, but you don't have to. You're being spiritual just by spending time with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. That's a spiritual act. And it says this, that a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Maybe the reason why we don't see more signs and wonders is because we're not doing it together. Because this, the, the fact is this, is isolation will rob you of your power. Anyone that claims it's just me and Jesus has missed it. Don't ever say that. It's just me and Jesus. That, that, that's a, first of all, it's a lie from the devil. He's telling you you're alone. There's no just me and Jesus. We are the body of Christ. You can't, you can't, you can't just be a, a thumb in the body. We, we have this thing where we talk about pinkies. Like, how much, how much would it cost me to get rid of my pinky, right? Like, could I get a million bucks for my pinky? I might sell it on the black market for a million bucks. I'd probably regret it for the rest of my life, but I might do it. Because I have a lot, I, I need to get a lot of money for this building that we need to fix up and make it ours. I might give up my pinky. My thumb, that's a little more difficult, but I give up my pinky. Now, your pinky's valuable too, right? And if you lost your pinky fingernail, that would mean a lot to you, wouldn't it? Because you know that it's, it's part of your body. You need that. I don't know why you need it. Some of y'all just need it to look pretty, put paint or something on there. But you listen, you were not meant to follow Jesus alone. Let me say this. Only lost sheep travel alone. See, we worship together. We serve together. We grow together. We also struggle together. We fail together. We grow together. We fulfill God's mandate on the earth together because we follow Jesus together. This is the life we've chosen. We've chosen to follow Jesus. And he's, he's got a whole lot of other people following him that you can learn from, that you can grow from, that have the faith that you need. And sometimes you don't have the faith that you need for something, but your friend has that faith. Right. And those are the people that I want to spend most of my time with are people that are full of faith. Yes. So you need people that are committed to community, you need to be a person to committed, be committed to community. Number two is this. Faith-filled friends are committed or, or content, contend. I put content. It's contend. Contend for breakthrough. Faith-filled friends contend for breakthrough. They don't just put on Facebook, I'll be praying for you. And they don't even pray for you. There are people that will shoot you a message or give a phone call and say, hey, let me, let me pray with you right now. That's, that's a friend that I need when I'm going through something. I don't need just a little hug on Facebook and a little bit I'm praying for you because I know that I've done that before and I didn't pray for people. Guilty. It's been a long time since I've done that, but I have done it before. No, we need people that are willing to go through the straw and the wood and all the junk that's on top of the house. You dig, I peel the roof off the stinking house to get my friend there. So the way these houses were constructed is they would have, they would have staircases on the outside of the house. And then many of the roofs were, the, the houses would be made of stone and usually the roof would be made of wood and straw on top of that house for the roof. And that was, you know, that would provide, you know, some cooling and some things like that. They didn't make it real solid. They made it in a way that were, where it would work with, you know, because they didn't have AC. Now they did because the roof was gone. And so these guys climb up on the roof and they literally tear all this rubble off. It's messy. Stuff's falling on people. People are getting mad. You're getting me dirty. Jesus came to town, and I I wore my best robe, and here you are getting stuff all over it. Do you know how hard it is to wash this thing? 
making a mess, willing to do whatever it takes to get their friend to Jesus, barging in and interrupting Jesus as he preached the word. Who do you think you are? I think I'm this man's friend, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get a miracle to him or him to a miracle. And we're not just going to sit at the house and pray, Lord, by your sovereignty, would you heal our friend? We're not just going to post it on Facebook. Y'all be praying for my friend. We're going to head on over with our friend. Because we hear that the spirit of the Lord is there to heal. So we're going to get our friend there. Friends, find a way. Friends, just find a way. I want to ask you a question. Are you getting your lost friends to Jesus? Some of y'all are just partying with your lost friends. That ain't going to win them. They want something different. Show them you got something different. Listen, it's easy. And a lot of times what we, this is how we do evangelism in 2023. I just want to be a good friend to them. I just, I just want, to, want, want to be empathetic with what they're going through. I just want to be there by their bedside. You can be there by them, their bedside all day long, and that's maybe what you need to do to develop that relationship. But there comes a time when you need to gather together with your other friends and get in that house and pick up that mat and go over to where Jesus is and dig the roof off and do whatever it is in your power to get your friends to Jesus. They don't need you just to be nice to them. They need you to get them to Jesus. The, the, the more important thing with this, with this young man that gets healed, the more important thing with him getting healed was his sins getting forgiven. And listen, I'm not talking about being dogmatic and being ugly, but are you presenting the gospel or are you just being nice? Because I can send some Muslim friends over to their house to be nice to them and they'll never get them to Jesus. The difference is our message. The difference is the man, Jesus. And how can they hear unless someone tells them? See, some people will only counter the Lord. Some people are only going to come to Jesus because you're in their life. Not because you bring them to church, because you are there with them. Because you have coffee with them and say, tell me about Jesus. And they go, "Uh, uh, great, I like Jesus. Awesome. Who do you say he is? That's all you have to say. And that'll tell you where they're at. Your friends need forgiveness. They need healing. Will you help get them to the master? What kind of friend are you being if you don't give them the greatest thing that has ever happened to you? What if you are hiding the cure? What kind of friend are we being if we don't bring them to an encounter with Jesus? What kind of friend are we being? You say, man, that's a lot of pressure, pastor. Good. Feel the pressure and respond to it. Feel the pressure because the pressure isn't coming from me. It's coming from the Lord. The Great Commission isn't changing anytime soon. So friends will find a way, and they will contend for breakthrough. And you'll, you'll do that with your lost friends. And listen, we'll do this with, our, with, with those, our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We will go to war. Come on, when you're str- this is why you need people, not just to feel sorry for you. It's great, but people that will actually pray for you, people that will actually counsel you, people that will bring a strong word to you but also the same people that will rejoice with you. So we had, we have this best friend church. I was, I was meeting with my, my friend, Pastor Mac Shirley. Y'all know Pastor Mac. He's been here before. And, and, uh, and Mac, they have a church in Arlington called Authentic. And y'all have heard us talk about that. We're, we're in relationship. They're, they're kind of, we're kind of like best friend churches. And uh, Mac told me that this week. He's like, we're, we're best friend churches. And I, I've been talking to Mac about the news of the building and all this kind of stuff. Well, several years ago, Mac and his wife sat right back there, right back there where Jimmy is. And, the, you know, we are the house of the open womb. They were having some issues. And, and the Lord opened her womb. And so several times I've been over there in an event and 
Pastor Mac will get me to pray. And we pray over people. They've sent people over on a Sunday morning to get their wombs healed. And they've gotten healed. So we've, we've seen this crazy thing, this crazy relationship where we're, we're sowing into them. Well, so Pastor Mac, about a year ago, got a building given to him. Like an awesome building. And he was afraid to tell me because he knew that we had been looking for so long. But I've been praying for Mac, and, and he's my little brother. He's my little brother in the Lord. And we, we spent a lot of time together praying with one another. And, and they have been praying for us this whole time about a building and contending with us. And so when Mac got the building, he didn't want to say anything to me because he didn't want to hurt my feelings. And I was like, I sent him the text, like many of y'all sent this week. He's like, so what's the news? And he's like, we got a building. And I was like, I want to see it. Because in his mind, I was going to be heartbroken because they got it before we did, and they've been a church for five years, and we've been a church for 10 years. And he, he's told me this. He, he was weeping when he, when he told me. He said, I asked the Lord. He said, Lord, why, why are you doing this to us? What about Josh? They've been going longer than us. Like, I, I've sat across the table with him weeping with me about it. And then he showed, walks me through the building, and I'm celebrating because I've learned to celebrate what I want in others. Come on, and I'm celebrating with them. And so... I told Mac this week, we had lunch. I told him, I said, hey, I said, this is what's happening. We're announcing it on Sunday. He's all fired up. We're lit. We're brainstorming. I'm showing him like all my stuff on my computer that I'm drawing up and dreaming. And he's like, that's awesome. We're, we're going crazy. And he's like, can I do this? Since we've been praying, can I share with Authentic? Can I share with Authentic about what's going on at Overflow and how you guys are giving a building? I was like, yeah, absolutely. He said, well, we'll video it and we'll send it to you. And we have it right now. Y'all want to see it? Well, let me tell you something I want you to know. I brought one of my friends here. His name is Pastor Josh Brown at Overflow Church in Grand Prairie. And I brought him here to show him, look what God is doing. Look at this, this building that God gave us, all right? And there was a tension point in me as I did because I knew I knew that him and his church, they're 12 years old, they had been praying and saving up for a new building. And they were getting money together and faith together. They were ready to do it, and they just couldn't find anywhere to be. And now here we are. I'm younger than him. Our church is not even four years old. And I'm showing him, look, what you've been waiting on, God already did to us. And it happened like that. with us today because we developed those friendships through contending, through praying, through praying for wombs to be open. Come on, through dealing with the heartache, for me seeing a building and going, man, you know, I want one too, Lord. But people that will contend with you, you've got to have that. Number one, you've got to have people that are committed to community, people that will contend for breakthrough. You've got to be this also. Number three, friends that will carry the weight. 
friends that will carry the weight. Can you imagine these four friends grabbing the corners of this mat and lowering you? Can you imagine? I mean, they weren't like engineers. I mean, they might have been. They took the roof off. I don't, I don't think all of them were. Maybe one of them was really smart, and he was like, well, if you don't do it this way, the whole thing's going to collapse and we'll die. But they, here they are. They're lowering the weight. Lowering, it says this, they lowered it steadily in verse 4. Because if one guy wasn't holding it just right, that thing, he's going to slip right off. Yeah. Now we're going to have other injuries that need to be healed. <laughs> Listen, we need friends that are willing to be strong when we're weak, that they don't let go when the weight gets heavy. And we need to be that. We need to be that to people because sometimes it's heavy to be a friend. Yeah. Come on. Sometimes you're like, oh, man, I'm so sick. If they do this one more time, <laughs> I'll keep holding on. That's what you do. They muscle through it and they keep holding on. You know, it's like we, we need the Rick Roll friends, right? Y'all know the Rick Roll friends? Never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down. Come on, that's the kind of friends you need. I thought y'all would think that was a little funnier, but uh, obviously, planned comedy doesn't always work. Listen, I don't want friends that just sit with me in the pain. I want friends that will find a way to get me whole, that will muscle through all the junk, all the, 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 the difficulty that it is to deal with Josh Brown. Because <laughs> it's not easy to hold my mat up. I can tell you that right now. But I have friends in my life that are willing to muscle through. You, you've, you've carried that weight before, and you know, like, man, I don't know how long, much longer I can hold on. There's strength in community. And that's the beautiful thing is there are four friends. There wasn't just one. Because when one, one arm got a little bit weak, the other one had to kick in to keep it steady. And listen, sometimes carrying the weight means saying the difficult thing. And as friends, sometimes we don't, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, especially in 2023. We don't want to hurt. Oh, I just want to be nice. I want everybody to think, I, you think the church needs some, you know, Jesus needs some kind of rebrand or, you know, I, I just don't want to say anything. I don't want to preach the scriptures and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But listen, being a good friend means saying the difficult thing to your lost friends, to your found friends. Come on. See, Proverbs 27, 6 says this, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Have you ever had a friend hurt you? They're, listen, if they've never hurt you, they're probably not a great friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Listen, you don't want flattery in your friendships. You want honesty. Good friends don't just make you feel good. They sharpen you, right? We know Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens another. You need someone to knock off your rough edges. Well, that's right. That's the Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit through your friends. So when your friends speak the harsh word to you, don't call them toxic. Amen. Well, they're just so toxic because they didn't make me feel good. Ugh. Listen, you need to find friends that won't ignore your issues, that will call you out. Don't call toxic what is a gift from God. This is what toxic would be. Someone who gets you caught up in sin. Someone who gets you caught up in gossip. Someone who gets you caught up in lies. lies. Someone who would affirm poor life choices. Toxic, toxic would be someone who writes you off because you made a mistake. Toxic would be someone who harbors bitterness and unforgiveness. Someone that continually reminded you of how bad that person treated you, and it's okay for you to be mad about it. It's okay for you to be bitter about it. That's toxic. And we would say that's affirmation. If they're affirming you in the wrong thing, that's toxic. You need people that are willing to knock off your edges. You need a friend that's going to be straight, that's going to make you mad, that's going to hurt your feelings, not just to affirm you in the midst of your suffering, but to get you where you need to be to be free. And I'm so glad that these friends weren't like, well, you hurt our feelings the other day, so we're not going to show up and carry your mat anywhere. We know you need a social life. But you can just stay home and be comfortable because we're upset because you said that robe doesn't look good on me <laughs> or that you had a bad attitude about your parents 
or your pastor. Find friends that will position you to walk right. Find friends that will position you to walk right. And that's what these friends were. They were full of faith and they taught them how to walk right. What are your friendships like? I'm not saying you don't need to have lost friends. You need to have lost friends, but that's not where you need to spend most of your time. Listen, if you have lost friends, they are your mission. Well, I don't want to have an agenda. Well, you better develop one because your agenda is to spread the gospel on the whole planet. So guess what? If they don't know Jesus, it's your job to declare the word. You can't save them, but it is your job to tell them what God says in the most kind and compassionate and tender way. So Jesus reveals these things. See, what I love about this story is that there's four friends, but there's not just four friends. There's a fifth friend, and Jesus is the fifth friend. Don't you love that? And and, and, and five, five is the number of grace. Five is the number of grace, and Jesus is the grace that you need. You might have really good friendships, but if you don't have Jesus, you're not going to have the grace that you need. And then Jesus, the fifth friend, says these five words to this man. And it says it this way in Luke. It says, friend, your sins are forgiven. Come on, he gives him the grace. The fifth friend, Jesus. I love John chapter 1, verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. The law came through a man. But God's grace and his truth was instituted through Jesus, the God-man, God in the flesh. Grace personified, grace and truth. What does Jesus reveal? Real quick, Jesus reveals several things. First of all, he reveals himself. In this moment, what does Jesus do? He takes the opportunity to reveal who he is. And what does he do? He forgives the man of his sin. Only God can forgive sin. And Jesus does it. And that man was a sinner. We say, oh, he's a victim. He was a victim. He's a sinner. And so Jesus dealt with the most important issue first, his sin. If he was going to walk straight, then his body wasn't the only thing that needed to be healed. Some of you need an alignment in here. You're thinking about the miracle. And Jesus is saying, if you want to walk straight, if you want to live straight, there needs to be some alignment right here. And listen, one of the reasons why Jesus does that is because the religious leaders of the day believe this. They believe that if you were sick, (laughs) some people still believe this stuff. If you're sick, it's because you have sin in your life. If you're paralyzed, you got sin in your life. Well, that's funny because we all have sin in our life and we're not all sick. I guess they thought they were sinless. Are there some some sicknesses that are caused from sin? Sure. But all sin, all all sickness is is a result from the fall, all of it. And Jesus came to reverse the fall. All sickness, all, all, all disease. Jesus came to reverse those effects. So Jesus was was speaking to the man, your sins are forgiven, but he's proclaiming it to everyone in the room. Jesus was not just showing the man and his friends he could heal him. He was showing that he was God. So he reveals himself. Number two is he reveals our identity. In every encounter, he reveals our identity. So in Luke's account, he calls him friend, but in Mark, what we're reading from, he says this, son. Don't you love that? Jesus is fathering him in this moment, son. What's he, what's he declaring? He's, he's declaring his identity. And see, so we, we emphasize these encounters all the time. What is the thing that God's gonna do? He's gonna reveal himself, and then he's gonna reveal to you who you are. You are a child of God, and you are loved by God, and you are adored by God. This is your, you're valuable to God. This is your identity. He loves you so deeply, so deeply. Which one did he say? Well, they're both just terms of endearment. It's, it's, it's an affirming of, 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 of who he created you to be. We, see, we discover Jesus 
when Jesus reveals who he is. We discover who we are when Jesus reveals who he is. We discover who we are when Jesus reveals who he is. So when you come into these moments, just don't be like, oh man, I love the little gooseys. I love the way worship felt today. That's great. But did you walk out knowing more about the reality of who he is? Did you do a greater revelation of him? And do you know something about yourself that you didn't know because the Lord revealed it? He didn't know that he was the son of God. But because the Lord would clean his slate, he would, by, as, as John chapter 1 tells us, that we have the rights, the exousia, to become children of God because we place faith in him. So we get identity. Number three, we get position. Your sins are forgiven. Son, friend, your sins are forgiven. You are right with God. The fourth thing that we get is that changes is our condition and our direction. Everything changes. Everything changes. We don't just add Jesus on. Everything changes. Notice he doesn't leave him in the condition he was. He doesn't leave him that way. This is what I love about encountering the Lord. If you really encounter the Lord, you're, everything changes. I'm, listen, I'm not talking about little fuzzies. I'm not talking about just a little moment, little surface level. The Lord touched me today. Every Sunday we pray at 10 o'clock that people, every person that walks in this place would leave this place completely changed. It has nothing to do because you're not good enough. It's just because you encounter the Lord and you look more like him when you leave. Get up, take up your mat, and go home. And I love it that he was going to go home a different man. And it wasn't just because he was walking. It was because his heart had been transformed. He was clean. Baby, you can come up. Listen, some of you, as I've been talking today, you, you, you've thought... I wish I had friends like that. And one of the things that, that we love about Overflow is, it, is the friendships, the community. Call it what you want, the family aspect. We follow Jesus together. And people sense that when they walk through the doors. All, all, we, we hear this on a weekly basis. But we've also had people that have come in and have been like, I can't get connected with anyone. And so they blame, and we, listen, we work really hard on this. It didn't happen by accident. It happened because we were intentional. But sometimes people don't have friends because they're not intentional. And I'm, I'm telling you that out of, out of love from my heart, it says this in Proverbs 18, 24, it says this, a friend must show himself friendly. So you can't just walk in the room and some of y'all, you just kind of hiding out, sneaking out, and go and leave and go, I need a friend. Well, you, you, you got to be friendly. Because I'm kind of over the top, right? Some of y'all, the first time you came, you're like, dude, that guy's like a little bit too much. Like, yeah, I showed up, and he's like, hey, how you doing? How'd you find out about us? Blah, 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 blah. Jess is so sweet, and I'm over there being like, hey, new person. <laughs> right? You're like, I really like Jess. <laughs> Pastor should probably just go to his office after service. He's chasing me. I chase people. If someone new comes, I will chase them into the parking lot. <laughs> I know it's funny. But are you friendly? Well, I'm just not a people person. Well, you're going to have to become one if you want to have friends. I'm not asking you to be an extrovert. I'm not asking you to be somebody you're not. But you're going to have to learn to, to use the muscles in your face to smile a little bit. And to be a little bit more approachable. And to maybe show up at a home group. Or maybe show up before service starts at least. Are you friendly? These are just the two questions I have for you if you think I, I wish I had friends. And number two is this, are you practicing forgiveness? Because mo all of us, all of us had had friends. And all of us have been hurt by friends. And I've known some people that don't have friends and they're not good at friendships because they don't know how to forgive people. Your friends will hurt you. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Your friends should be hurting you. Not harming you. Come on, there's a difference between hurt and harm. Not harming you, but hurting you. 
And if you haven't navigated relational tension and disagreements, then your friendship is a surface level. Your friendships haven't been tested. And if you can't forgive a friend, then you haven't loved a friend. Because the greatest expression of love is forgiveness. But this is what I believe the Lord wants to do today. Those are just two tips for those of you that are like, I'm just so lonely. Listen, I love you. I want you to get so deeply connected. I don't want you to be lonely. There's nothing worse than feeling lonely, nothing. But what is in the room today is that people that will be your friend. Let's stand up. I feel like the Lord wants to heal some relational wounds. Just a moment. I know we've done a lot today. Listen, just a moment. Just close your eyes. Some of you today, you just, you just feel a lot of pain. You, you even thought, I don't, I don't know that I could open up to everyone, anyone ever again. What I'm gonna ask right now is that the Holy Spirit begin to heal some of those relational wounds and you could see the value of friendships because the Lord will use that to heal you, to bring healing to your soul. Come on, just allow that. He's here. Just allow that healing oil right now, that healing balm just to flow over the crevices of your heart, those hard places. Thank you for joining us at Overflow Church today. We hope that you are encouraged and encountered the reality of Jesus. If you did, please let us know in the comments and make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss anything that we have coming up. Have a great day.